Hey, good morning, guys. Um, this is Abel. Uh, I'm Abel Zill. I'm the owner and founder of Zill Vardos. I build tiny houses here in Olympia, Washington. And um, this is my live stream, which is uh, called Ask Zill Live. And here I answer your questions about building tiny houses, most specifically, but just building, really, because um, it is just building. So, um, first of all, I wanted to say the mar the marches yesterday, uh, two point nine million people. Uh, that's like a really heartwarming thing. Um, what that all means is that yeah, the like the mainstream is not the only way to do things, and and I think like tiny houses are part of this also. Um, people are rethinking how they live, how much their impact is on the earth around them, on the people around them, who they're sharing this land with. Um, we're just sharing it. We're just here temporarily. We're renters, so to speak. Um, you know, we don't really own it. Uh, there were people here before us. There'll be people here after us. Um, but anyway, it's like really heartwarming to see that many people come out for a cause such as women's rights. Um, that leads me into uh, something. I'm going to open up the comments here. Uh, and uh, uh, I should mention that most of the tiny houses I build for people are for um, women in their getting close to their golden years. Um, a little bit older women. That's like the main demographic of people that I I see come around and buy tiny houses from me, and that's that's really amazing. They're they're, you know, finding a place, uh, building a structure that they can take with them. Uh, they can go live with their family. They can live somewhere out in the country. Anyway, it's uh, you know, it's all. It, it is. <laughs> women are a big part of the tiny house movement. Um, so thank you, women in my life. Um, I'm just to commemorate that, I'm drinking coffee from my um, mom mug. Love you, mom. Um, so, what I am going to start with this morning is, um, let's talk a little bit about, I'm going to get the camera to kind of see what's going on here. Let's talk a little bit about um, how people lay out the the interiors of their tiny houses. Um, I just thought this would be a good thing, good way to get things started. People are always really interested in floor plans, which is kind of funny because building like the shell of a house is actually a little more important. Like how you arrange the inside, eh, that's flexible. You'll edit it as it goes on. But like, for whatever reason, people are pretty obsessed with how their floors are laid out. <laughs> Excuse me, in the tiny houses. I'm, I'm still kind of getting over being sick, so I might cough once in a while, but sorry about that. Just bear with me. I'm actually a lot better at um, doing great. Uh, so, um, what I do have here is, um, let's see, I'll just sketch up an example. I'll, I'll kind of show you how I put them together. Um, let's see if I can just get right in so you can see what's going on. We're just, I'm just using daylight here. Hopefully this, this works really well. Um, and then I guess um, it'll be kind of like right side up to me and kind of sideways to you. And I think that's okay, actually. Let's just get as close as we can. Um, this little arm holder. Okay, so I start everything um, with a, a, a notepad, a notebook. Um, and it kind of looks like this. I'll use a darker pencil. Um, so like a, a really standard tiny house is like this rectangle. Um, that kind of goes like this. The most common sizes I built is like this, you know, eight foot by twenty-four foot. So that's a little. So let's just say this is an eight foot by twenty foot house. Um, and I'm not gonna like you know put dimensions on here right away, uh, because you know let's, let's keep it simple. Um, but I am kind of visually putting things where I know they fit. Um, so. One thing 
that you know if you're if you're kind of creating a design for an interior that some people really don't account for is how thick the walls are so say if your trailer is measuring you know if it's a 96 inch that's common for me um there's like these little bit of you know we put we put wooden ledgers on the outside so we ended up with a 99 inch floor and then the walls have a thickness and usually it's about four and a half inches so like really if you kind of draw that on the plan what you're looking at is this you know these are the walls they take up a little room and so people sometimes don't account for that when they're designing their first house and they just draw a box and they put some stuff in it and they're like oh look how much look how much I can fit in there but really you 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 know, it's not about fitting more, especially with the tiny house, this is about kind of minimalism. So, um, so, um, you know, one of the questions is what can you kind of leave out or simplify so that these things actually fit? Um, and, uh, so there's only kind of so many ways you can put a tiny house interior together. And then people like, like like new ideas and creativity but like it's a really small space and so there's kind of some practical ways to go at it i i have found if you guys find this interesting i don't know um but please ask me more questions about it if you like um i uh, see one came through from uh jenny nor says what items do you expect a customer to provide for their interiors that really, sorry, you're just seeing my hands here. Um, I can get in the picture a little bit. Uh, hey there. Um, that really depends. Um, some people have like pieces of furniture and they tell me about that. And so I, I in fact, these days, because I use a computer, I, I, I actually like model the pieces of furniture. Sometimes it's just a box or something, but you know, if it's a couch, I'll make a rudimentary couch and put it in the and that's one of the advantages of using a computer or a program like SketchUp is that you can kind of fit everything in again you do have to take into account thickness of the actual building materials the walls of your house the fenders the doors um, if if you're gonna have it all work out otherwise what you find out is hey when you start building there's there's not gonna be enough room for everything so one thing I found that really helps is when you put the door like in the middle of the side um, and that saves room because when you have an entry into the end of a tiny house then you kind of have to create a hall and a hall is actually wasted space so and I'm just this is one approach there's a lot of ways to go about it. and there I've done a lot of end entry end entries too and often they work just fine you just put like you know cabinets on either side or there's a super minimal bathroom tucked into one side but let's just say it's a side entry um also just for the sake of it a lot of you may have trailers with fenders so I'm just gonna draw a fender in there where it kind of exists. They're, they're usually like five feet long and they protrude into the house. Um, I don't know, like by the time you take into the account the walls, this, they protrude into the house like another six inches. But you usually, you put insulation on them. So you have to take that into account. Okay, see how it goes here? Here's the insulation that goes around the fenders. Um, I use like two inch foam, that's R13, that's, you know, it's kind of a minimal insulation, but then you have to build a little wooden box to hold that. So, um, fenders. So there's the fenders. Those, um, and those are uh, usually about 10 to 12 inches high inside the house. So you can put cabinets over those, or you can even build a little bench or a couch that goes over. But again, you don't have to build anything. You can just kind of have it there and you'll fit your furniture around it, or you'll find something else. You put like a table there or something, you know, it, 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 like in my first tiny house, there's a table that's right over the fender and like, you put the chairs on either side and the fender's kind of like a little place to put your foot up on. Um, so then we need a front door. So I'm, I'm just going to arbitrarily like pick a spot. Um, I, I like to use as wide of doors as I can. So, so like I use the 36 inch door, um, because it's just like universally accessible. Um, you can get furniture in and out of it very easily. It doesn't have to be that wide. But again, you know, for code and safety stuff, also it's kind of nice to have the bigger door. Um, 36 is a really nice standard for a main entry door. 
you may have other doors in your house. So you may have like sliders or something and that's totally cool too. The sliders are kind of a little more engineering and a little more cost, but um, they double as a giant window. So that's a plus. Okay, so I could go on and on. Let me see what questions I have going here. Um, for, okay, Jenny Noor uh, again com uh, adds to her comment about what do I expect a customer to provide versus what I provide. Um, I guess I'll kind of show you what usually goes into a house um, that I build, but you know, again, every everybody's different, and I like not to crowd the main space, you know. So, so say like, this is the door. We're gonna like, we're gonna put the bathroom down. Here's one configuration. We'll we'll just like say the this bathroom is gonna be like four and a half feet deep, or maybe four feet deep. I don't know, and we're gonna make a wall there. And it's gonna have a door. Which way does that door swing? I don't know. You know, like this this is, you know, kind of an important consideration. Bathroom door can be smaller. Um, but you know, again, you don't wanna over over small your your doors. You know, a twenty two or a twenty four inch door that you know, that's two feet is is pretty small. So, you know, if you can get twenty six or twenty eight inches for a bathroom door, that is that's great. I'm just gonna say this is twenty six inches. Um, and the front door can swing in, um, but honestly, swinging doors, I'm, I've really been liking the, sw the outward swinging door. Um, people have different feelings about, you know, what it means to have a door swing in or off. It swings out, it can blow around in the wind, but you can put a, um, a restrainer or stop. My friend Rick used to put a, a loop of rope on the wall. He'd screw it to the wall. You know, this is like a little more cabin-y stuff, but he'd screw a loop of rope to the wall. And when you swing the door all the way open, he, you flip it around the doorknob and it holds it open. It's like the most reliable, least noisy, not less likely to rust or break than all of the weird little RV door hold backs and that shit. You know, it breaks. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so, so this is a super simple bathroom. I'm going to just keep it just dreadfully simple and say this area is... The shower, that's actually a huge shower stall. Doesn't even have to be all of that area, but. Um, oh, well, here, I'll make it like, in one house I had the shower stall here. There's like a little wall. This is the shower. This is the shower head over here, you know, like. And then these were these little deep shelves and there was a little door on that too. Um, you know, linen cabinet, basically. So um, that's linen cabinet. And then over here, um, there's honestly enough room for, like, uh, a toilet. I know there's lots of kinds of toilet, but I'm just going to draw a regular toilet because some people... I, I make... I, I build as many houses with flush toilets as I do with composting toilets. So there... And then there's these really cool, like, narrow sinks, which I am kind of into now. They're, like, so small. Um, and that, for in a tiny house, is great because, you know, you only have so much room. So here's the little tiny sink. So you can kind of get it all in a bathroom. This is a shower. I might have a shower curtain. I might have a door. Um, glass doors are really expensive, um, but you know, whatever. And then, uh, well, heck, if this is your bathroom, maybe you want a nice little window um, right there. And that would open. Uh, my windows usually open outward. Um, I use casement windows. I build my own, but you know, you don't, you probably won't build your own windows if you're building for the first time. So, so that's a simple bathroom. Um, then one way to kind of approach it, otherwise, is, you know, like, you can just make the kitchen. Like, so here's the refrigerator. Get a small one. Um, it can be an under-counter type. I like under-counter types, but some people don't like to bend down that far, so that's cool. I'll just start the kitchen on the other side. And then let's just say, since there's all this fender here, um, kitchen can be, uh, normal kitchen counter is like 25 inches deep, so I'm going to actually draw that. It's out here, you know. Uh, takes up a little room in a tiny house, you'll find out. I'm going to draw it, and then it's going to cover the fender. So how about that? And that, that's probably, geez, that's really long. That's like a nine-foot kitchen. But, you know, if you like to cook, why not? Um, so, so there will be some sort of um, uh, I can, let's, just, let's just put a little, like, two-burner, you know, two-burner range top. Um, and the sink will be over here somewhere. Um, I like single basin sinks with drainers on the side, but you know, whatever. Um, it's not about what I like sometimes, it's about what the person I'm building for wants. There's a sink. Um, I'm gonna put windows. 
How about two, two windows? Those are the kitchen windows. Maybe those swing out too. Okay, anyway. Um, this could go on forever, but I'm just kind of showing you some basic ideas about you don't have a lot of room in a tiny house, um, and uh, sometimes there's just so many ways it can go together. Um, I guess the the last thing I should touch on, so, so this leaves a main room totally free for whatever you want to put in there, and that's really wonderful. You know, you can put, you, there are pre-made tables you can buy. <coughs> um, and you guys can see all this okay, I guess? Um, uh, you know, you could have like a pantry cabinet here, shelves, you know, if you're building for the first time, keep your, keep your stuff simple, um, or use pre-made cabinetry, you know, it takes a lot of time, that's, that's, you know, it'll, it'll expand your project in cost and time. Um, sometimes I have like an armoire in the house of some sort. Um, sometimes the longer, if the house is a little bit longer, like 24 feet or even 22, I can build a, a ground floor bed platform here. Um, we can kind of partially wall it in and make it a, a nook, so to speak, but some people just like it open. Um, you know, if they're the only person living in the house, they don't really need to close the curtain to go to sleep. They just go, you know, lay down and they make the bed really neat if they have company or whatever. <laughs> But that's what tiny houses are about. They're about being super efficient. Um, but let's talk about lofts for a moment. If you've got a bathroom uh, down here, then it kind of stands to reason that this is where the loft will be. So I'm just going to, you know, because I'm because I'm crazy like this, I'm going to draw the loft at this, you know, an angle. Sometimes I make them curve, but I'm just going to draw an angle across the back. And then, then you're going to be like, well, geez, how am I going to get up there? Uh, so, uh, where's the ladder, where's the stairs? A lot of people want stairs these days, so that, that's its own thing. Um, the loft could be on this end, maybe, in this, in this kind of a layout, but, <coughs> it could be over here. So, what we could do is use an eraser. <laughs> um, this is why I love erasers. Uh, and, then, let's just say that there's this wonderful, um, I won't go into ladder details, but let's say there's one of all like ship's ladder that kind of exists in this space, you know, so it's going to be a ship's ladder is steep with kind of like handrails on either side, um, but they're really comfy to climb, and that's how you get up in the loft. And then let's just like put the front door over here. <laughs> See, why not? Why not? Um, you know, let's just open it this way. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. People are all about like aerodynamics and maybe the door should open away from the way the house is traveling and I don't know, you're only going to be driving like once every two years, so um, wouldn't worry about that. Anyway, so um, let's call this a 36 inch door and uh, yeah, so see now you got a pretty pretty sweet layout. You could put seating over here, um, you could have um, overstuffed chairs, the fender's going to get away, but you could put a little table here. Um, it could be something that folds up. Uh, anyway, so this is one, only one way, but it's just like a really efficient way to jam everything into a tiny house that is maybe like, uh, you know, let's say this one is just arbitrary. Let's just say it's 22 feet long. Um, so I see that I got another question. Um, let me come back up here. Hi, can I drive this thing? <laughs> um, Arek Orbre asks, how do you feel about metal framing? Um, metal framing is great. It's, it's a, as a building material goes, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's an engineered system. So what that means is that it, it's kind of, it can, it's kind of not for everybody. It can limit, because you need, you need a, the right kind of saw blade and you need to use exactly the right kind of fasteners. So it's a little less versatile than wood. Um, it isn't necessarily much stronger than wood. Um, it can be a tiny bit lighter, but anytime that you transition between steel and wood, you know, they're like very, they have very different properties. Um, steel is great. We have to use steel for something, especially that's a trailer, like, or we're not gonna build a wood trailer, right? 
um, is because wood has an unpredictable lifespan because it's biodegradable. Steel is also biodegradable. It's not biodegradable, but it, it can go away over time, but that takes a long time. So something like a trailer frame may be there like, you know, there may be some remnants of it like 500 years later if you like threw one out in the woods and just let it do its thing. <laughs> Depending on how much paint is on it. Um, so, uh, but anyway, steel is a very different material. And whenever you transition from one, from steel to wood, you increase your expense and the kind of the difficulty of fastening them together because you have to integrate them into a cohesive structure, basically. You don't want, you know, you don't, well, that's not true. I mean, like, the big skyscrapers are like, have these steel structures and then they kind of hang the building on the steel structures. So the actual, like, the floors and the outside of the glass and the outside of the building is like, hanging by itself it can move like each floor can move independently of the other it's it's kind of crazy they do that for re it's that's high high tech engineering um compared to tiny houses but the idea is that you know well the building materials don't have to be connected to each other but in the case of a house and especially one that goes down the road we are going to integrate the materials so we're going to stick the wood to the metal and have them work together as this this one structure. And so so steel framing creates a little extra complication, a little extra cost. Um, and I think for a for a first time builder the trade-offs unless you're getting like a kit and there there are like, you know, trailer made trailers was working with this company that would do like a kit with steel framing and that might be a really like handy thing for somebody who's building the first time unless you want to learn the art of framing. I mean, you know, framing's easy in all of the the carpentry trades. Um, and if you want to do wood framing like that, there's a ton of knowledge out there readily available. Like you can find people that know how to wood frame and get help any day of the week, but you have to go find the right person to consult with if you want help with getting metal framing integrated correctly in your house and what the headers will look like over the windows and stuff like that. So metal framing is engineered, wood framing is ostensibly yes but it's a much more like people's engineering you know like there's a lot of different ways to do it and a lot of right ways if that makes sense so um so for a do-it-yourselfer you know it's it's if, if you if you really attach to some property of metal framing then go for it but if not it's it's not more fireproof in fact it's i would say it's a little worse than a fire um at the uh, wood burns at this particular rate and so it doesn't lose its structure immediately whereas metal framing it gets hot and it basically crumples it 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 changes the structure of a thin it's thin steel and um unless you have heavier steel members that can stand up to a fire uh it's less fireproof again in a tiny house fi just have a general plan for how to be safe about fire they're so small that if a fire starts, you know about it. You know, it's not like the bottom story is going to catch on fire and the people on the fourth story, you know, there's no four story tiny houses. So the, the, the concerns are not quite as complicated and that's good. That's why we build tiny houses. They're simpler. Okay. And another question from, um, Okay, I think I, I'm going to reinterpret this question because it's in a couple pieces here. Jenny Noor asks, um, what is the interior footprint space once the interior wallboard or, you know, plywood or paneling is on? <coughs> and again, that depends on the thickness, but I'm assuming that we're going to be building, in most cases, uh, with three and a half inch, that's what you call like a two by four or something, lumber or metal studs for example um three and a half inch wall with the insulation in that um thicker not usually necessary in a, in a one-story structure like a tiny house so um what so i have my deck um on, on on my kind of bigger trailers measuring it like 99 inches and if you subtract basically four and a half from each side uh, you know that's it's it's not quite that much. It's more like four from each side, um, because interior wall coverings usually aren't that thick, and the exterior actually goes on the outside of that ninety nine. So, the you know the exterior 
plywood sheathing or you know OSB or whatever you're using. So let's just say it's 99. We're gonna go down here. Uh, 99 minus 8. So that gives us 91 inches inside. And that's great. That is um, 5 inches less than 8 feet. Um, and that's pretty good. So and you can apply the same. So the, the base is, you know, will be 22 feet and 3 inches. Uh, this is a decent with my um, kind of ledgers that I usually bolt to the, the trailer frame. So I say 22 feet and 3 inches is the, and then you would subtract 8 inches from that. 8 inches, I know that is going to be 21 feet and what? 7 inches. 21 feet, 7 inches. Yeah. Um, am I adding right? <laughs> Maybe more coffee. I did bring peanut butter toast. Pardon me. I'm keeping me, I'm keeping me going. I need breakfast. Um. Reading questions. Um. All right, YouTube Jag. Again, some of you guys' names are uh, a little hard to pronounce, and I'll just do my best. Um, but you'll know who I'm talking about. YouTube Jag asks. Some lofts have very low height. Is it feasible to raise lower the loft floor, like some RVs, to produce extra headroom? Eliminates ladder and stairs. Okay, we're talking about the, 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 the beds that like come down on four screw lifts. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, that's feasible. You have to buy that equipment. And RV equipment is not often as reliable. It's, it's designed to last, you know, five years, if you're lucky, RVs aren't designed to last all that long. They're kind of a a more short lifespan thing. So I don't, I don't like to use complicated stuff like that. Um, I think there's a diminishing return. You know, you add this technical complexity, you're relying on this machine to, to, to crank your bed up and down. And if it breaks, then you're sleeping on the couch until you get it fixed. And it could be really expensive. Um, so, um, the loft question is interesting. Um, I, because, just because I'm not your like totally typical builder, I play a trick with the lofts and I take advantage of the stiffness of a single sheet of three quarter inch plywood and I build my loft out of that. And that sounds a little crazy. Um, but I position it over supporting structures and or I put a vertical edge along the front that can span the, what do we say, 91 inches um, and support the front of the loft that is, you know, cantilevered. Cantilever means it's like balanced over, uh, you know, the, the far end of a, a stress member is, is, well, wait, here, here, I can show you what cantilevered is. So like, if the loft sticks out this way, um, and it's continuous over a, a supporting thing, then if you press down on here, it's gonna transfer, you know, a, a load to the other side. So it's actually gonna push up a little bit. In practice, it's not very much. But um, the idea is that it, the stiffness of the support beam, or in this case that I'm talking about is plywood is enough to hold it up. So if it does have a seam, I put the seam like way back here. Okay. Anyway, that's the idea of cantilevering. Um, and it, you see it in certain roof rafters and, and lofts and, um, and there's a lot of information about how to use cantilevering in a structure. Um, but anyway, I do that so that my lofts don't have like joists holding them up. I mean, occasionally I'll put a support of some sort, but really I don't. And it, it makes it like more headroom. So then my I put my lofts at like various heights depending on who I'm building for. So it's very custom. Um, and the other like little complicated thing is if that's over a bathroom, you have to get a shower that you can shorten. Some like one piece fiberglass stalls are just one, they're like 70, 
four inches, 76 inches, or maybe it's 78. It, they're a certain height, and so you can't just like saw them off. Um, so you have to get a, a, a shower enclosure that you can adjust. Or you can use like a tub with a shower curtain, and that can be any height. Um, but basically you get it so that you've got a couple inches of headroom, and that really feels comfy enough in a tiny house. So, um, so I don't use lofts that go up. In fact, the loft would have to have clear space below it with no... Uh, I guess you could, you know, one way to do that... I would, I, I would rather use something like a Murphy bed that's very reliable. It's basically the bed flops up against the... <laughs> flops up against the wall. And it's a little easier way, and that can even flop down if you don't mind it being a little raised. You can have, a, say, like a bed that flopped down over... Um, cabinetry or like a dining area or something so there's a little bit of trickiness you can play but the more tricky you are with cabinetry the the time slash materials cost goes up so the more transformative cabinetry is I know this is like a huge thing in the tiny house um, media is like oh well, this this like thing that pulls out and then there's two drawers that pull out of that and then you open one of the drawers and there's a cat box you know, I, <laughs> I am kind of making fun of it because it's a little hilarious how <coughs> obsessed people are with like cleverly transforming spaces. It, it's there is something to like carefully organized storage. You know, look at, a, at the sailboats with their like rounded holes and the weird little drawers that are shaped to fit them. Like, it's been doing it. We've been doing it for a hundred years or more. You know, well, more than that. I mean, there's some amazing carpentry from like time immemorial but like if you look at a sailboat for example it's like a little tiny space with a whole bunch of storage kind of built to fit it and it's really expensive it's really expensive to build that kind of cabinetry like boat um what do you call the interior joiner that does it's they call like a oh there's a name for a carpenter that does the interior carpentry of a boat and man it's expensive um okay i'm going on to another question um since I already drew a little floor plan, I'm going to walk around a little bit here and change the scene. Um, welcome to my, um, here, oh, I'm going to pull this thing, okay, I'm just going to carry the whole thing. Um, welcome to my little design studio here. Um, uh, if I can do this thing, this is where I sometimes draw. Um, here's, um, one of the computers that we use. Um, you can kind of see... Uh, there's a picture of a, I think that's a, that's a pinafore type house. Um, and then, anyway, this is one of my little design desks. It's a stand-up desk. Um, stand-up desks are great. I was sitting on this stool, um, that's designed by my carpenter, Carl. Um, and it's like a plywood box kind of stool. Carl likes to experiment with stuff like that. Um, and, uh, but I can also stand up and work at this desk. And that is a good thing if you spend a lot of time at a desk doing design stuff. Okay. So finish chattering about my design studio and take you guys back out into the shop um so next question um is uh cindy k asks uh i've been looking at direct vent fireplaces that are built into the wall but i'm sure you need to go with smaller btu propane fireplaces okay so she's curious okay Okay, I'm going to re-say that once more because I was taking it in pieces. Cindy K asks, I've been looking at direct vent fireplaces that are built into the wall. Um, she's asking about a lower BTU output, propane, and is curious about my thoughts on fireplaces. Um, well, here is... Um, there's different ways to approach um, a fireplace. And... Um, so let's let's just spin around this way. There's, woo, there's my shop. Okay, um, just trying to get at least glariness going on. And uh, um, so fireplaces. Um, there are a lot of different fireplaces. There are um, I think there are some really small propane fireplaces that that do. Uh, they're they're made to recess into a wall, but they may be uh, quite a bit thicker than you you think. I, in my experience, some of that stuff is like nine or ten inches deep. So 
you can either have it protrude on the back on the outside and you have to build like a little box out section um, or it can like protrude on the inside and you can trim it out um, I think those are great because they're pretty compact but you know usually to me they look kind of like a window that you see flames through you know it's it, it doesn't have quite the charm of like a wood stove but in a tiny house a wood stove takes up a or a, a stove that sits on the floor whether it's propane or wood or whatever takes up a huge amount of space it is tricky to find heating appliances that don't have that have low enough output to be used in a tiny house and or are small enough so yeah you you kind of you don't want like a 60,000 BTU stove I mean that's like <laughs> you'd like you basically turn your tiny house into an oven um you, you like I use little propane heaters that that rate between 8 and 10,000 BTUs so and you can use something slightly bigger if you know if it's well kind of regulated um but uh again you know also yeah try to find something small and so it's going to narrow it down to a few things out there but there are small appliances out there for heating um and we're talking about like a little propane fireplaces um uh, but a lot of them are designed for a much more conventional house, so so that's why a lot of them have a much higher output. Um, sometimes little propane inserts and stuff can be a little inefficient. Um, also, heating completely with gas um, can be expensive. Uh, it's rather convenient, um, but a small electric heater can be like really user friendly for a lot of people. So like consider. You know, you could do gas for the flames and for the look of it, or you could have a small wood stove kind of for the feel of it, but have a little electric heater that's, you know, doesn't have to be a lot. Um, a thousand watts. Um, I, I typically use these, like, stibles that are, like, 1,500 watts, and they don't have any fan, which I really like, so they're quiet. They're just totally silent. There's no moving parts. They don't break. They have a thermostat. They, they have, like, a... a, a freeze protect mode which means like if you leave your house for a week you put on freeze protect mode and it'll keep your house like 44 degrees but it won't let it freeze but it'll like run on a really low setting which a lot of thermostats don't do which so that's i, I like i like that it's very user friendly and like reliable and safe it's really hard to catch something on fire okay so i'll go into the next question um emily witt uh, asks why don't you use drywall in your houses I can answer that in a few different ways. I have done drywall many times in my life. I have done many remodels where I did I, I did the drywall myself. I'm, I'm somewhat good at smooth wall stuff. And then spray texture, sometimes I would hire somebody to do that step because they have better equipment than me. Uh, and I don't really like textured walls. Anyway, okay. So I'm familiar with drywall. In a tiny house, there's the house jiggles a lot when it goes down the road and that usually can break or crack your corner and between panel joints. So sheathing the whole interior of the house in drywall and, and spending a lot of time doing the mud seams, whether you're using a uh, hot setting mud or whatever, or I, I just, I like paper tape. Um, it's very strong. It, it's easy to fare out. Um, some people say that the like mesh tape's stronger, and I guess in some ways it is, but it's kind of unnecessary with dry. Anyway, I won't go into my feelings about drywall, but the joints can crack. It's heavy. Um, they they're making lighter drywalls now. It was it's very heavy compared to the wood interiors that I put on. So I do see that as like a significant weight. Like drywall and mud can add. I mean, if you did the whole, it had like thousand pounds of the weight of your house and if you put a bunch of plywood up you're adding like 450 for like quarter inch ply. it's just like or if, if even that and it's so it's like a huge difference um in weight um drywall is fire resistant and that is great and that's why that's why we use it it's cheap it's it's relatively low uh cost of labor to put up compared to like old systems of plaster and it's fire resistant and that's that's just great. It's not fire. 
proof, but it's fire resistant. Um, I would consider using a very thin panel, a non-flammable panels. Um, I, in fact, I, I have, uh, I kind of like, like the really thin concrete board. Um, just because it's really simple and you can put like, you can put these like colored finishes on it. It looks really kind of cool. And then you put battens. So basically you have to put something to cover the seam between the panels. Um, so I don't tend to use those things. Again, it's heavy compared to wood. Um, and people just ask for wood a lot in tiny houses. Um, but uh, I do offer uh, like a concrete type material for uh, fire resistance. Um, it helps, you know, it's still a wood structure, so. I mean, you could then start taking the structure apart and using less wood to, to build the structure, but again, that doesn't totally make it fire proof, so. Okay, um, <clears throat> take another question here. Ha <laughs> uh, Crystal McNamara, sorry, I'm laughing because I get this question sometimes. Crystal McNamara asks, I've been very curious about how you cut or bend the wood for your tiny house roof over your curved rafters. Um, I use a wide variety of techniques to create curved structures. Um, but interestingly, the one that I use the least is steam bending because it's, it's labor intensive and it requires really specifically clean lumber, and that usually translates into old growth, and I don't like to use old growth if I can. I mean, if, if there's like a piece of old growth that comes into the, f like I, I see it in the lumber yard and I take it because I wanna build furniture and like beautiful things out of it, but like, I don't like to use old growth for framing because it's a really precious resource. Like right now, cedar industry in the US is kind of at its wit's end. There's not sustainable cedar. It's all coming from way up in Canada and the line of cedar is receding. Um, that's going to change my... I mean, I'm, I'm totally okay with that. I'll, I'll find other wood. There's lots of other woods. There's more sustainable woods. Cedar is sustainable. It lasts a long time, which kind of makes it worth its slightly greater expense and a little harder to procure. But... Anyway, so I'm getting, getting off top. Sorry, I'm getting off topic. Back to the how do you cut or bend the wood? I cut, I lay out curved rafters. Um, I, used, I used to do this all by hand. I'd, I'd make giant patterns and put them down on the floor and trace the shapes I want and then extrapolate the like angled interface. This is like boat building stuff. I just do the same thing on the computer now, I lay it out and use the computer to kind of establish the structure in 3D space and I actually cut all the, the curved pieces now um, on my, uh, I, have a, I have a computer controlled router which I consider a really, uh, it's not a router, it's a CNC, um, that, that's no router, it's a, that's a, a digitally controlled spindle and um, I use this to cut all my, uh, shaped pieces and if they're longer than my table we can uh, do a something called a slide and uh, anyway so but a CNC is a very um, complicated thing with a long kind of a learning curve and um, so if you're building it yourself um, yeah you, you might not want to teach yourself how to you know spend a year learning how to do like CNC wood milling um, but it, it's it's fun I see it as a great creative tool and I'm kind of uh, Thankful that I have a friend Aaron who designed that and built it as a kit or gave it to me as a kit and like so I got into CNC rather affordably because I built my machine myself um, with stuff that Aaron you know it was Aaron's design but I, I assembled it and calibrated it and put it all together and it, you know over the last it's been in use for three years um, and I've upgraded it at times so um, and then otherwise I, I use sheet materials that can take the bend or I have methods for producing compound bent structures. Um, and I'm not going to get into those, but um, it's that's like my whole recent carpentry life has been creating curved structures. So um, it, it's pretty complicated stuff. Um, but it's, it's all doable. It's not too unrelated to boat building in some ways and not in others. Uh, 
Okay, uh, I'm going to take another question. Love more, judge less asks, um, I'm intrigued by the concept of two tiny house units that can be joined together once on site to create a larger living area. Can you share any info about your plans for that? Um, and you're brilliant. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm much... There's, there's lots of other brilliant builders out there. Um, yes, I think this is a great way to make tiny houses expandable. And I'm working on... I'm working on... Uh, I'll put it... I'll, I'll actually put the time lapse up. How, just for you, I will put the time lapse that I have thus far up on my YouTube channel of me engineering a, a, basically a fortune cookie with like a side um, connection. Um, so it's basically a, 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 the same shape. It comes off with this weird like 20 degree angle and you can dock another structure that would be built specifically for it you know so I, basically it's two tiny houses you can stick together um i think that's a great idea and it also i like doing them at like odd angles like why not it well i mean i guess it makes more complicated building on on my part but um it's not much of a stretch and it makes a, a more fluid it makes a more fluid living space like there, there's so many ways you can assemble boxes and bricks but like the cool thing about building with wood is that it's not constrained to be straight and square and come off at square angles like it's not that hard to build one wall canted at 20 degrees it's not it it becomes more hard to build curves and then to put the curves all together but that's kind of what motivates me is like making that stuff fit together so um i do have one that i'm currently engineering um i offered that to people as as a as a business you know if somebody wants to to hire me to build two tiny houses that fit together one might be a bedroom pod or something um or uh, one idea i recently came up with was um that one would be smaller and possible to travel with so if somebody was like a snowbird and like to, they they could take the one with like the kitchen and a little bath off down south and then there'd be one that's like a main room with sleeping lofts and stuff, and they would stick together when you're back home, um, which I kind of like that idea. It, you know, it, it, again, that's a little bit of engineering because you have to make the removable part closable. See, so you kind of have to have, like, either a spare wall or they just, like, two walls that come together and there's, like, doors. But when you take one away, you have to be able to, like, make it a functional independent structure. And that takes time. It costs money. Um. Anyway, yeah, I will... I'll get, I'll edit, I've already partially edited that, but I'll, um, I'll get some up. Maybe I'll, uh, get it up in, just, just check my, check back on my YouTube channel in, like, four days. Uh, I'll, I'll get, I'll get enough that you'll see, like, where the connection point is. Um, I'm, I'm early in that process, but I've been basically recording when I'm drafting and engineering, so you can kind of see this really accelerated, um, assembly of the, the house in computer land. Um, okay. Uh, the informer asks, have you ever used shipping containers in your work? And if not, will you in the future? Well, I can't ever quite say I won't do something, although I'm a shipping container houses are not my niche. Um, I already kind of have like a niche building curved wood structures. Um, I think shipping containers, I have a few feelings about those and, 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 I guess if you care, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, but I'll keep it brief. Um, I feel like a shipping container is this like structurally cohesive, like hunk of steel. <laughs> it's a big steel box that's made to be picked up and moved all over the world. And that's kind of its advantage. Um, I think as a structure you can get it for cheap and plop it down wherever it's kind of because it's so structural it's kind of its own thing but then then what happens with shipping container houses people carve huge holes in them because um because they want to have windows and doors and so by the time you carve it up you've interrupted the structure so much that no shipping company will come and it, it's not totally true you could probably engineer one that had like 
structural panels that would reintegrate the structure. But once you cut big holes in a steel box, but all of a sudden it loses all its strength. So no shipping company is going to come up, hitch it to their crane, and put it on their truck. They're going to say, no, no, this is a chopped up shipping container. We won't touch it. You know, not that it's not movable, but it it loses its like integral transportable quality. So that's the first part. Then you cut these holes in steel, and you have to. It's a little time-consuming and expensive to take these wiggle wall steel and weld or then reattach the interfaces. You need to put doors and windows and also to ventilate it because it's a totally vapor-tight structure. So if you're living inside of it and you just put insulation on the inside walls, you're probably going to have condensation issues. So you need to put a ventilation system in it and you need to cycle the air. So it's as, as a living structure, I feel like they're a little bit like impractical. Um, but as a shipping container, it's this well-engineered pod that can go all over the world. Um, so it, it, I feel like it loses its, in, its original engineering and kind of gains this pieced together quality. So that's my feelings about shipping containers. So I, I probably won't bite off any shipping container projects. And they're also, they're just shaped like a brick, you know, like you can put windows in a brick, but why not make it a different shape? <laughs> um, Okay, I don't want to be opinionated because there's some really, there's some okay bricks out there, but, you know, that, that's just, like, not my, my channel in life to deal with. Um, okay. Um, here's, this is, like, an insulation question. I got, <coughs> talked about this a bunch last week. Um, if something like Roxel is used. Roxel is a... Uh, I think it comes in bats or rolls. It might come in both, um, but it's a it's a it's a a bat type insulation. Um, so I'll just say that for those of you who don't know what rock sole is, it's it's also known it's a descendant of rock wool. <laughs> kind of sounds like it, um, which is an industrial byproduct that's spun into fibers. Um, so I have mixed feelings. Rock wool is pretty like, blech, you know, it's it's an industrial byproduct of like the petroleum slash steel industry so you know it it's not too different than glass fiber i guess but glass fiber is such a clean thing you know once they remove formaldehyde from glass fiber insulation then you know it it became pretty like innocuous like it's not if, if you're breathing you know once you put it in the structure it's totally contained and you're not going to be breathing glass fiber or rock salt for that matter but you know it's it's like Glass fibers are really like inert, affordable insulation. So at a base level, it's it's a really, there's lots of other insulation. But Roxol. So she so she asks if something like Roxol is used, how do you figure amount to buy by length, width, and height? Say for twenty. So the easiest way to do an insulation calculation. That's a great question, actually. Um, I kind of, sorry, I kind of cut short on reading it, but she's give, you're giving me exact measurements. I'm going to let you do the calculations. Um, so if you're building a, a house, um, you, you may have different insulations in your floor and ceiling. So calculate those first, and then y you will, if you have a design, you'll have the measurements of each of your walls, and, and you can just figure out the square footage of each wall. So if your end wall is like, eight feet wide by 11 feet high, then that's, you know, that's 88 square feet. And then you have two of those probably exactly the same size, I'm guessing, unless your house goes up or down. And so you add your walls together. And if you want, and you don't want to have too much left over, subtract out your large openings. Like, so if you have like a double sliding glass door, like that's six feet wide and seven feet high. And so that's 42. So subtract out 42 square feet. But then sometimes you add like a little percentage when you're calculating building materials by area. So uh, insulation, you can kind of ignore the doors and windows and that's your overage. Or you can subtract the doors and windows and add like 10%. Usually it's a wash. Um, but anyway, so you're adding up all your square footage and you get square footage and you can go to the store and, and get the insulation bundles, comes in bundles or rolls, will tell you exactly how many square feet it is if it's used in the normal way. Um, again, some insulation is kind of compressible, so you may get a slightly different, or loose insulation. 
Loose insulation can go in in different densities, and, and it can settle a lot in tiny houses. So be careful with loose insulation. Know what you're doing. Get some advice if you're doing that. But for that insulation, which is pretty easy to use, um, square footage, you calculate, take it, and that will tell you how many bats and rolls and or how much to buy. So there you go. Um, pretty easy. Um, so let's see. Uh, going on, how long have we been going on? A while. Oh my gosh, I might have to wrap it up, you guys. Um, how about this? So I did the floor plan drawing today, and next time we'll come back and maybe we'll do some... I don't know, you, you tell me. You ask me what you guys want to hear about, but like, I, I was one thing I was thinking was that we could talk about framing and like using glues in structural building, because that's something that comes up in tiny house building. Um, and I can kind of, you know, tell you the different ways to go about that. Uh, construction adhesive is sometimes used to put on sheathing and stuff, but, you know, again, it's not always totally necessary. Um, and we basically we're using shear wall engineering from regular building, but we're just kind of downsizing it slightly, so... Yeah, so so tell me what you want to talk about. If you don't don't tell me anything, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about framing next week, next Sunday. Um, thanks for watching. Um, I'm gonna close by going out and to take a look and see how the floor is doing in the tiny house. I'm just finished with here, so let's see. This is a little bird house. It is about to go to. Pennsylvania. Um, there is the floor. Just got finished. Um, we blackened the oak via, that's red oak, um, via, via a secret recipe <laughs> that I learned from an old con, uh, old carpenter. Um, I'm going to come in here and let's see. I have to do this while I'm holding my phone in here. I'm gonna turn on these lights. And there they are. Um, I'm uh, doing some plumbing today. Here's the kitchen. There's this fire clay sink, which is sweet, but gosh darn it, it doesn't fit normal drains, so I'm, I'm searching for a drain for it. Um, the bathroom. Uh, sorry, there's a bit of plumbing in there. Uh, nature's head toilet. Uh, penny tile floor. Oh my god, it's very pretty. Um, and one of Bill Hillman's amazing windows. Um, this guy is just amazing. Um, he's local to me. He's been doing stained glass for like 40 years. Um, he's an artist in every sense of the word. Um, he really, like, his control of color and texture is just incredible. Um, let's see if I can get you a look at the other one. Um, that is incredible. He built an arch for this house. Um, just like a subtle use of color, the way the texture all lines up in that Sunburst is just beautiful. Um, can't even believe it. Um, cedar interior. Um, more stained glass by Bill. Oh my gosh. Look at this. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I, I want stained glass for myself someday here. Um, I'll uh, get to it. Here, uh, this is really awesome queen-size bed platform. Again, this is, this is a kind of a little bit of an analog to the original like little bird that I built for Aaron. Um, if, if, if that rings a bell. Um, this one's got a little cleaner cabinetry. Um, I just like the hand scoop. These big giant drawers. Um, they're huge. They're three feet deep. Um, and behind the drawers, there's more storage. There's two drop... I, sorry, there's... This is what a building project looks like when we're almost done with it. Um, there's a, a water tank underneath there and a, a, a pump. There's the pump. Um... And uh, so it's set up to be filled and, and uh, have a reserve of water, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, here's the windows that I built for this house. Um, we're working on the screens right now. This house leaves my shop in exactly one week. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just to give you guys a little look at it. Um, and uh, I'm going to wrap up. Um, you guys see me okay? Uh, so thanks. Okay, there's a car over there. <laughs> let's, let's, let's hop out. All right, that's better. Um, thanks for joining me and asking me questions. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm having fun. Hope you're having fun as well. Um, 
shoot me more questions by the comments if you want me to get to them next week. Um, I didn't see many come through last time, but maybe I just didn't look well enough. Um, but yeah, you can uh, put them in the comments. After I complete this video, it'll allow comments. Um, and uh, I'll be on next week, next Sunday, 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, I'm here in Olympia, Washington. Um, so in rainy Olympia, um, I'm going to do the Ask Zill live stream again. And uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, wherever you press the subscribe button, and you will hear about um, the live streams and tiny house um, walkthrough. I've, I, I've been taking a little video of each house I complete um, that looks a little better than this, um, you know, walking around with the camera and uh, shaky video. I've been doing some good video shots of my tiny houses, and I will get more of those up shortly. Um, so stay tuned and uh, join me next week. Thanks, guys. Till next time.